Enter Chris Claremont. The X-Men brand was revived in 1975 with Giant Size X-Men number one by writer Len Wein and artist Dave Cockrum. The keys were handed to Chris Claremont, who to this day always will be the best X-Men writer of all time. He's also the longest comic writer for any series in history, an achievement in my opinion will never be broken. He wrote X-Men from X-Men issue 94, all new, all different X-Men, which absolutely has nothing to do with all new, all different Marvel trash of the mid 2010s. They called them the all new, all different X-Men because they were rebranding them after uh, giant size X-Men. Uh, this book would also be later renamed to the Uncanny X-Men when they hit issue 114. So Claremont wrote issue 94 in 1975 all the way through X-Men, Uncanny X-Men 279 in 1991. And uh, also wrote X-Men Volume 2, Issues 1 and 3. Uh, and then he had conflicts with the editor, and that kind of spelled the end of his run. But 16 years, man. 16 fucking glorious years, dude. Chris And Chris Claremont's the standard. He's the consensus best writer of the X-Men ever. You can debate it. You know, there's, there's, you know, you can, you can bring up other examples, but I mean, he had such a long run. Some people will argue like towards the end, it wasn't as good. I don't think so. I think he did Inferno towards somewhat towards the latter part of his career. Uh, I mean, I love all his stuff and, and I missed, I was like on the back end of Claremont, you know, cause I was like, when X-Men volume two came out, I was like fucking 11 years old or 10 years old. You know what I'm saying? But I loved X-Men so much at that point. I was, it was way easier to collect back issues from the early eighties, you know, back in 1991 and <laughs> 1990 than it is now. Cause they're fucking, especially with the X-Men, they're worth so much. Um, but yeah, Chris Claremont was so talented and creative that Marvel had replied back to some of his work when they pitched to hire him and they didn't even realize he was, he was fucking 16 years old when they hired him. In fact, I think some of his writing and stuff, it was back when he was 15. And then when they replied and then he went and interviewed, he was actually 16 at that point. So, you know, as a writer, he spent about nine years writing for Marvel before he was given the opportunity to take on the revitalization of the X-Men. And it was Len Wein who at the time uh, when he created giant size X-Men, he was actually Marvel's editor in chief. And that's why he was, you know, given the task to try to reboot them and all that. And he had seen, like, the enthusiasm and the love that Claremont had for the X-Men reboot. And he took a chance by, you know, handing him the honor of uh, taking over what Ween and Cochran started. And now, obviously, Claremont didn't do it all himself. Uh, it was a, it's kind of like George Lucas. We know Marsha did the editing, whoop, whoop, whatever. You know, obviously George Lucas had to create ILM and he had to get the right people, you know, in place. And, and everybody worked together as a great team to make the awesome Star Wars franchise that we know. Well, it's the same thing with the X-Men, dude. I mean, Claremont didn't do it all on himself. He had great artists like Dave Cockrum, John Byrne, John Romita Jr., Paul Smith, um, and then Jim Shooter would also become the editor in chief in Marvel from 78 to 87, which is a couple years after Claremont had started the X-Men run. And that's kind of when Claremont had really kind of hit the ground running. Uh, revisionist history is going to try to tear down Jim Shooter, but this guy oversaw and greenlit some of Marvel's greatest history, uh, or some of Marvel's greatest runs in comic book history. We're talking Chris Claremont and John Burns X-Men runs. We're talking Frank Miller Daredevil. Frickin' Walt Simonson, Thor, John Burns, Fantastic Four, Roger Stern's Avengers and Amazing Spider-Man runs. Uh, and also, I think Roger Stern, I believe, is the author also of uh, Triumph and Torment. I think you guys have heard me talk about that a couple times. That's Doctor Doom and Doctor Strange versus Mephisto for uh, Doctor Doom's mother's soul. Uh, fucking great. That was like a standalone 90 something page frickin' um, you know, book from the early 80s. Um, and then also the OG Secret Wars. And OG Secret Wars was fun, massive, badass display of heroes and villains battling it out. And when it all ended, there was no multiverse, there was no retcons, there was no time travel, there was no continuity errors. You got the introduction of the symbiote suit that Spider-Man wore, which later on would become Venom. Um, just fucking everything, dude. And it's still to this day my favorite version of Secret Wars. On top of that, Claremont also credit... Um, Credits a lot to Louise Simonson, uh, who became X-Men editor-in-chief 
uh, for the X-Men division because it started getting so big, uh, which is which is when Claremont really hit his stride on the X-Books. Uh, there's a great documentary on Claremont, and it shows, like, this guy's intelligence, how humble he was. Um, if uh, I don't even know the name of it, dude, but if one of my mods can Google Chris Claremont, history or video you'll it's like an hour and a half or something like that if you guys can find it great if not no worries i'll post it like on a on a public chat uh or like on my public community tab or whatever but i would suggest watching it dude it's very interesting it's it's awesome dude and and basically claremont what he did he used Luis's perspective as a female and helping him establish and create a plethora of awesome feminine female characters not fucking female retreads that act like they're men to show how tough they are no they were actually like feminine female characters that had fucking like personalities and they acted like women <laughs> and it added a reality to who these female characters were and how they would act uh, louise had experience editing great comics like vampirella conan the barbarian star wars indiana jones the new mutants and obviously uncanny x-men is you know which what her what her greatest accomplishment would be uh, a little time later uh we'll get into like great x-men comic runs that claremont created um but i'm gonna kind of combo that up with like what the mcu should do and how they're gonna fuck up the x-men um i didn't get a chance to get all that this prep dude obviously with all the the hectic uh you know holiday and all that stuff so i'm getting into that next time for sure um just to touch on some of the great characters that claremont co-created or created uh, I'll get into these characters in detail on other streams as well. Uh, there's so much X-Men history, stories, characters. I could make videos for months, maybe even years, on just the X-Men alone. Uh, anyways, uh, Claremont created awesome characters, such as one of my favorite X-Men characters, Gambit, Remy LeBeau. Uh, one of my favorite villains, Mr. Sinister. Uh, he also created Sabretooth, Forge, Captain Britain, Pyro, Avalanche, Strong guy of the New Mutants slash New X Factor, one of my least favorite characters, but hey, WAP love. He gave us an Italian hero, not an anti-hero or a stereotypical villain, which most Italians are. Uh, I could finally see myself in a comic character. <laughs> not uh, when it comes to female characters he created. Listen to this diverse, not only in looks but set of great female characters, none of which are retreads. They're not cheap ripoffs with identical or similar powers or mannerisms of pre-existing characters. He created one of my favorite and my oldest daughter's favorite female character, the iconic Rogue. Fuck yeah. One of my other favorites is Betsy Braddock, sister of uh, Captain Britain, Psylocke. Now, I know there's no doubt Psylocke is nice on the eyes, to say the least, but Psylocke is far from just some hot-looking female character. Her comic book lore is complex, insane, and some overall, there's just way overall fucking crazy shit going on with her character. At one point, just to keep it simple, she transports her consciousness into a Japanese assassin for the hand known as Quanon. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. I could I could do like an entire live stream on Psylocke alone, dude. She's fucking badass. Uh, the Entity of the Phoenix, of course. Jean Grey's uh, entire Phoenix storyline and persona, also created by Claremont. Emma Frost, the White Queen, another one of Car uh, Claremont's female characters. Uh, Kitty Pride, aka Shadowcat. Mystique, to the one of this uh, to this day, one of the most known X Men villains. Jubilee, a fan favorite of the '90s animated show. Uh, Mariko Yoshida, a major Wolverine love interest. Rachel Summers, Madeline Pryor, a clone of Jean Grey, who later becomes the Goblin Queen. Lady, Lady Mastermind and Siren. Claremont also did something nobody in our circle of the internet would believe. He wrote a great Ms. Marvel, Carol Danvers comic run. Now, now known as Captain Marvel or the female Captain Marvel. No, Carol Danvers was Ms. Marvel. That's right. The unlovable, annoying character that Brie Larson plays is written very well by Claremont. If you want confirmation of this, check out my buddy Trinity at Second Street Marvel. 
He's read the run somewhat recently. Uh, he's going to be more versed in it than I am because I haven't run it in a, in a long time. Uh, that being said, both my daughters grew up and learned how to play video games on Mortal Kombat and Marvel Ultimate Alliance. My oldest learned on Marvel Ultimate Alliance 1 and Xbox 360 um, on Xbox 360. And then my younger of, of the two daughters learned how to play uh, Ultimate Alliance 2 on PS3, I think it was. PS3, PS4, yeah, it was PS3. Uh, who is a character they both played with all the time? Ms. Marvel. They fucking loved Ms. Marvel. That same Ms. Marvel they would be a target audience for when Captain Marvel released in the MCU. Both of them can't stand the fucking character. They can't stand the movie. They can't stand the depiction. Furthermore, my youngest daughter also is a target audience for the new Ms. Marvel, Kamala Khan. And that Ms. Marvel show was the last MCU show she ever tried to watch. She couldn't even make it through the second episode. She was pissed off at the way they disrespected Thor and the Avengers by talking about in the beginning intro. Oh, and it was all because of Miss Marvel. And I understand, like, that's her little lore and whatever. They, the self-insert that made freaking Ms. Marvel, you know, oh, she's this big fan girl of Captain Marvel. But they had to shit on all the characters that came first. And that's the whole problem with Phase 4. And five, whatever you can call it, phase 20 right now, if they want, it doesn't change what they're doing. They shit on the Infinity Stones, they shit on Thanos, they shit on the fucking Avengers, and and wow, lo and behold, they got a movie that can't even break 200 fucking million worldwide right now, and that's specifically why. Uh, so, and then another thing, my older daughter, she dipped out earlier. She couldn't deal with the bastardization of Loki on the Loki show. Way to go, Feige. Way to go, MCU. You drove away two female Marvel diehards for your shit movies and your bullshit messaging. You chose agenda over storytelling. Bravo.